boogie lamp problem, right? Number 42. Floor to ceiling lava lamps. We have a little lava lamp down our basement, but nothing like that. It says the fixed cost for the lamps is $1,000. The variable costs are $60 for each lamp. And um, so that first sentence is going to help you with part A, the monthly cost function. And then the second sentence says, the company estimates that 100 lamps can be sold for a price of $100. Seven more lamps can be sold for each decrease of $5 in the price. Let X represent the number of lamps produced each month. So that second sentence about these, uh, how much the price is, price being 100 bucks. Okay, I remember talking to Tyler and CJ and they were telling me, well, the price is what I need if I wanna get the revenue function. Once you have cost and revenue, we know that profit is just equal to what? Revenue minus costs, right? So that's kind of like a, a quick sketch of what we want to do. So here's Stephen and Brian, we're working on this. And so for part A, well, this is a linear function, right? In slope intercept form, because the thousand dollars is the fixed cost you have to pay no matter what. And then it says $60 per lamp. So I think that as long as you understand the concepts there about fixed costs and variable costs, then writing that function should be OK. You guys with me? It's a linear function, which makes it especially nice to graph, right? I mean, I don't have a graph here, but I could quite easily, you know? I'd say, well, okay. If I make no lamps, the cost is a thousand, and I know it goes up sixty dollars per lamp. So I don't know. It looks something like that. It's a line. This is my cost function. Okay, part B. So the first thing these guys did is they wrote a negative five over seven equals point seven one four. Why'd you do that? What's going on here with this fraction? Negative 5, 7. Well, since it says uh, 7 more lambs can be sold for each decrease of $5. In the price. Okay, yeah. So if I can do this, I want to kind of highlight a little bit of what they're doing here. If you look over on the, on the right, the form that they're using is y minus y1, it, we've done this a lot, is m times x minus x1. This is my point slope form. And they're saying, okay, I'm gonna try and for part b, right? Well, what we're doing here, okay, and, and he labeled this nicely. Steeple said, Steven said, we're gonna have a price function. And he says, I think the price function is linear. Now, how do we know that? I, in all honesty, we don't really know that the price is a linear function, but it says the company estimates a couple of things. First of all, they estimate that 100 lamps equals $100 price, right? So the price, basically, price of 100 equals 100. That's kind of like having the point 100, 100 on my graph, right? So if I were to come over here and graph the price function, I know it goes through 100, 100. You guys with me? And I also know that the price function it says that if I increase the price, what? Seven dollars? No. Right. If I decrease the, the price five dollars, then I that's that's corresponds to seven more lamps being sold. So again, what I have here is that this is the number of lamps, which is X, and this is the price. So another point on the graph would be 107, but the price is only what? 95. You guys with me? And I heard Lauren and Ben talking about, about it like this. And then what you can do is you could say, 
Well, my slope is going to be 1. Well, how about I do 95 minus 100, because those are the y values, divided by 107 minus 100, uh, 100, because those are the x values. Well, if you get this, you get negative 5 sevenths. Okay? Now, I don't think Stevens group did it that way. I think they said, look, you're going to drop, if you drop $5, right? That's the increase in, when you increase seven lamps. So that's two different ways of looking at it. You know? But if we're assuming it's linear, then, then it's going to be of this form, y equals, well, eventually, look how they wrote it. They wrote it as y equals mx plus b. I, I like that. Because now you really have what p of x is. It's negative 0.714x plus 171.4. And so over here, the revenue function is that price function they just found times x because you have to multiply by the number that you sell at that price if you want to get the revenue. And uh, so Stephen worked that out nicely for us here. It's a good job. And then for part C, profit would be the revenue function I just found minus the cost function that I found earlier. I have to distribute the negative. I get a parabola. And then it looks like you kind of jumped right to the maximum. How'd you find this maximum? Did you use a calculator? Yeah. 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 OK. But it's funny, because everything here could have been taught in college algebra, could have been taught somewhere else, right? I didn't use any calculus, per se. So I want to do that. I want to finish by using a little bit of calculus here, right? And where does the calculus come into play? Really at the end, that last step right here, we can use calculus to, uh, to go about this, right? So let me go ahead and write capital P of X. See, I use a little p for price. Capital P of X, my profit function, if I believe everything they did, which I do, 0.714X squared uh, plus 111.4X minus 1,000. That's my profit function. And I want to maximize this, right? So how do I maximize it? This is what we learned. We learned about finding what are called critical values, right? Because we learned something. We learned that the maximum value, the maximum value of the profit function will either occur at the critical value or where else? Where could it occur? Endpoint. At the endpoints, right? Might occur at one of the endpoints. So let me go ahead and do this. P prime of x is what I'm going to need, right? We know how to do that at this point. So let's see if I bring the 2 down, I'm getting negative 1.428x plus 111.4, right? So now I want to go ahead and solve for x. So let's see. Because what I do here is we set this equal to what? Zero. Yeah. Set the, set the derivative equal to 0 to find the critical values. And so let's see. I get 111.4 is equal to 1.428x. So I'll divide by 1.428 on both sides. And I'll get what x equals. Over here, this cancels. So actually, I want a calculator now. Pull that out. OK. Turn it on. Clear this out. We get 111.4. Bring that out where you can see it a little better divided by 1.428, and we'll get an x value, 78, about 78. Right? So supposedly I should make about 78 
of these boogie lamps. And that's exactly what these guys said, 78.01, right? And they'll bring in about $3,300, right? How do you get this, by the way? This $3,300, yeah. Put the X in where? I guess what we want is we want to take the, yeah, this profit function, right? We're trying to maximize the profit. So let me go ahead and show you guys a couple things. I'm going to compute P of 78, right? And so maybe the way to do that, um, well, let's do this. I'll do negative 0.714. X squared plus 111.4 X minus 1,000. Now I've shown you how to do it on the graphing, but I, you can also just type that on the home screen and it'll spit out some kind of number. Now the weird thing is, where'd that number come from? Well the thing is, is that there's some value for X that's always stored in the calculator. X has a value. And you can change what that value is. What do I want the value of x to be? Well, I'd like it to be about 78, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this. I'm going to type in 78. And this little P over here, you guys know what this stands for? STO? Store, yeah. A lot of times people think it launches Sports Time Ohio on your calculator. It won't do that. But it'll store something. So you put the little arrow and you go alpha x. Where did x go? It's right above it, right? So I'm going to store 78 into x. And now I'm going to do this. I'm going to hit second, enter. I don't want that one. I'm going to hit second, enter twice. Because you can keep going back and kind of scrolling through the things you already typed. So now when I type this, and now that I've stored the value of 78 in for x, it does the algebra for me and gets that same value that Steven got, that 3345. That's kind of nice. It's a nice way to maybe, you know, um, check the value of a function. So we just worked out that P of 78 is, well, 33, 45, 22, right? The other things that I really should check out is I should check out the endpoints as well. Um, what is the profit for, well, the endpoints? Uh, between 50 and 200, right? So I want to compute P of 50, and I want to compute P of 200. The maximum and the minimum values on a closed interval will occur either at the endpoints or at the or at the um, critical value. So let me try this. Let me take uh, 50, store that in for X again. So I hit alpha x. And now I'm going to bring that function up again. Let's see what p of 50 is. 27.85. So you'll make a profit when you uh, make 50 of these boogie lamps, but you won't make as much profit, right? You're just not selling as many. And now we want P of 200, so let's try it one more time. 200, store, alpha x. And now I'm going to compute P of 200 in the same way. There it is. Oh, so what's that mean? Big time, right? I just lost. $7,280, right? You can go ahead and sell 200 boogie lamps, but not for a profit, right? Why? Why would we lose money? Yeah? Because after $100, or after uh, 100 lamps are sold, it decreases by, the price decreases by $5. Yeah. So think of it this way, right? If you sold, if you wanted to sell 120 of these lamps, right, or 200 of these lamps, let's say that. So you want to get an extra 100 lamps in, you'd have to really decrease the price. 
So for that extra 100 lamps, what, what would the price be in order to get 200 sold? Let's look at the price function again. Well, remember, it's negative 5 sevenths is the slope, right? So let's see. Every $5 that the price goes down gives me another 7. Now, 7 times 14 would be 98. Okay. So for an extra 14 times, yeah. So maybe I should do seven times 10, right? Seven times 10. How do I say this, guys? I'm trying to say it. Hmm. Seven times 14 is 98. What's 14 times five? 70. Okay. So basically, the, if you were to follow this line, let me go look at the graph again for price. If you were to follow this line for price and you say, I want to see where, what's the price to get 200 of these lamps sold, right? You'd have to drop the price of the lamp more than $70. This is going to be like 28 or 29. Now, why are you going to lose so much money? Well, think about the cost function. What does it cost to produce each lamp? Where's that? 60, 60 plus a little more, right? Yeah. And if you're only selling them for 28, yeah, you're going to lose big time. <laughs> In other words, what this means is there just isn't a market here for 200. I, I may have the capability to produce 200 lamps, but it doesn't mean I should. And, you, and it, this, is, this is almost what you call a rookie business mistake. People say, let's go bigger. Let's go big. Let's add a store. Hmm. Well, you can. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. And speaking of stores, the grocery store business in Northeast Ohio learned this about, what, five years ago? All of a sudden, and then boom, they're gone. Um, there was a big expansion. A bunch of stores started kind of going everywhere. Maybe, maybe 10 years ago now. But, uh, but it's interesting. I mean, you see this in all kinds of businesses. Anyways, I think this is a really nice problem. And it, it shows a little calculus and, you know, maybe demonstrates a little bit. And so I want to talk a little bit about, well, a few things here, okay? First of all, what do I even mean by a second derivative? Okay. Well, maybe I'll go back to the problem we just did a as my very first example. Um, because, although I guess I have to pull Stephen's notebook back if I want to do that. No, I can do it. Here, we'll just do it on a blank sheet right here. So, remind me, guys, what was our profit function? P of X was, you've got to read it off for me here because I don't have it with me. What we got, guys? Okay, x squared yep. plus one seventy one point four. Or I'm sorry, uh, plus one eleven point four two x. Okay. Minus a thousand. Minus a thousand. Okay, so it was something like that. And what we computed during the lesson was we computed p p prime of x. And so we got negative 1.4284x plus 111.42, okay? This is called the first derivative. But when you have a derivative, that's just another function. And so there's nothing to say that you couldn't take the derivative of the derivative. And that's what I want to do. And it's going to be called the second derivative. Now, in this example, it's actually kind of boring, the second derivative, but insightful, I think. So I'll show you what's going on here. The second derivative here, let's see, p double prime of x is the way you're going to write it. It's just the derivative of the first derivative. So what would it be? It would be, well, negative 1.4284, right? 
because the derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of any constant is 0. So that's it, right? It's just a, in this example, it's just a number. Usually it's going to be another function, right? I mean, that is a function, it's just a constant function. So there's my examples of, uh, my first example of a, a second derivative. And somehow that's going to tell me more about the graph. And we're going to learn something today called the second derivative test, and that'll be quite useful. So, what does the second derivative tell me? It tells me a few things. Um, one thing I want to talk about is what's called concavity. Okay. A graph can be concave up or concave down. The graph of a function can be concave up or concave down. And that word concave, how many have heard that word before? You know when I heard it? I want to say it was first or second grade. We are talking about lenses in science class. You guys remember this? They talked about concave versus convex. You guys remember that? That's where I heard it. And it's actually the same idea. It's talking about kind of the curvature of the graph. Okay. So, maybe back to our example, okay, you know, basically what happens is because this second derivative is always negative, right? Re remember how in the first derivative test, I don't even care what the value of the first derivative is. All I care about is it positive or is it negative, right? What did a positive first derivative tell you? If you have a positive first derivative, what did that tell you? The, the function must be increasing, right, because the slope is positive. And a negative first derivative means that the slope is decreasing. Well, the second derivative also tells me something. If the second derivative is always negative, that tells me something. That tells me that this function is always what I'm going to call concave down. What I mean by that is, think about this parabola. Which way does this parabola open? You guys know that from algebra. Which way does this parabola open? has to. How do you know? You got this negative, right? You see that? So if they, you, the negative value of a told you it's this kind of parabola, well, the calculus also tells me that this is concave down. But it's going to tell me that even more so kind of in, a better, in other examples. It's going to tell me more. So we have to learn about concavity here. And so I'd, I'd like to... Um, and then I'm going to talk about two other things, okay? So maybe I'll define these for you. Points of inflection we're going to learn about. So what are points of inflection? Points of inflection, you know, they're kind of like critical values in a way. They, they are places where the graph switches, where the graph changes its concavity. So if it was concave down, maybe you'll get to a place where now it's concave up, or vice versa. Okay? And then I'm also going to talk about what's called the second derivative test. We'll be doing that um, today, but I want to wait for a minute on that maybe. Okay. So I think a great example to use um, is this one that we've already played with quite a bit f of x equals x e to the x, okay? And I know you've worked it out before, you need the product rule. But what I'd like you to do this time is compute both the first and the second derivatives, and then we'll talk about it, okay? And we'll see where this takes us. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and compute the, uh, the second derivative, but I guess my question is, which way do you write the first derivative? Did you guys write it the way I did here? Or did you factor out and write it the way I did here? First one. You the first one? Yeah. Is that what everyone did? Okay. 
So if you did the first derivative this way, and now what I want is I want the second derivative. Let me go ahead and compute that. Okay. So what's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Now, it's funny. The derivative of x e to the x, I just computed that. So I'll basically just write this down again. So plus e to the x plus x e to the x, right? So what I really get is, let's see, 2 e to the x plus x e to the x, right? That's the second derivative. Let me do one more thing. Let me write the second derivative factored. That's actually useful, OK? So because again, what I do, see, remember, we care about is the second derivative positive or negative, right? So what I want to do is figure out, well, where does it equal 0? And I can make a sign diagram. We've played this game before with first derivatives. Now we're going to play it with second derivatives. So let me go ahead and, and do that. So let's see. Um, what do I do here? Well, I guess I would write 2 plus x e to the x, right? Because e to the x is the common factor. OK. So maybe a question. Where does f double prime of x equal 0? That's the question I want to ask. You also would ask, where is it undefined? But this one's not undefined anywhere. And I'm going to make a sine diagram. Then. Okay. So you guys, what would you say? Where does this equal 0? I guess i got to work it out, huh? So set it equal to 0, right? And I get 2 plus x equals 0, or e to the x equals 0. What do you guys tell me about that? So x could be negative 2. Right? Uh, this one doesn't have any solutions, right? e to the x equals 0. Because we know e to the x. We know that graph. e to the x is always positive. So this one, I guess the only place that f double prime of x equals 0 is right at negative 2. OK. OK, let's test concavity. So I'm going to do a test point. Tell you what, I'm going to try f double prime of 0. That equals 2 plus 0 times e to the 0. So is that positive or negative? Well, that's positive, right? So you have 2 times 1. So if it's positive, that means over here, what can I say about my curve? My curve is concave what? Up. up. Right. What about over here? CJ, give me a point to use as a test point for the other side. One more, negative three. Okay, negative three. So this would be two minus three times e to the negative three, and this is a negative number because it's negative one times what kind of number? Yeah, e to, the, e to the anything is positive. So negative times positive. This is negative, right? And so what that shows is that over here, the curve is concave down. Okay. Now you've seen this curve before. You've seen this curve before. Let me show you one more time so we can take a peek at what it looks like. But I think you're going to notice some things. Hmm. Will you or not? I don't know. Maybe I should draw it again. I mean, what we found before about this curve, here, let me go ahead and draw it on my paper. I think it'll be a little bit clearer. Okay, so I, I go ahead and draw a graph of x e to the x, right? Right there in the green. And so this function goes through 0, 0, and then takes off, right? And then it comes this way, and then it comes up, 
and then it becomes asymptotic with the x-axis. Now, you guys remember what this minimum value was? Do you remember what the x value was where it reached a minimum? We did it before. The way we did it was we took the first derivative and set it equal to zero. There it is right there. What's the critical value? Negative one. Yeah, that was the minimum, negative one. That was like one of the first examples we did. And what I'm saying now is that right here at negative two, oh, what's this called? This is called a point of what? Right. That's what I was trying to get at. It's where it changed. You could see it on the picture. We're concave down. Now from here on out, we're concave up. Again, what do I mean by that? Hmm. It's like this. I'm decreasing, I'm decreasing, I'm decreasing. I'm decreasing more, I'm decreasing more, I'm decreasing more. Right? Once you get past the point of inflection, I'm still decreasing, but I'm decreasing less. I'm decreasing, but it's not as steep anymore. I'm decreasing, but not very steep. Until I get to negative one, right? That's, that's where it bottoms out, and then what's it do after that? It increases, and it increases more and more and more and more and more. So again, the second derivative, think of it this way. It's the rate of change of the rate of change. That's kind of strange. The rate of change of the rate of change. You know, one place that we have this is on our vehicles. We drive here every day. So when you drive your car, there's a dial that tells you your rate of change. What's it called? The speedometer right? The speedometer. How do you make the speedometer change? You press the what? It's sometimes called the gas pedal. It's also called the accelerator. Acceleration is changing the rate of change. Now, if I press the accelerator, does the speedometer go up? Well, yeah, as long as I'm, you know, not dragging, not spinning my wheels, right? If I let off the accelerator, then the speedometer goes down, but, but I'm still moving forward, right? So, so the second derivative is this acceleration or deceleration. Here I'm hitting the brake, hitting the brake, hitting the brake. Now I let off the brake and actually increase. It's the rate of change of rate of change. Okay. We'll do more of this in a little bit. Um, I'm at almost 10.15. I think I ought to stop for you guys' normal break. Whatever homework you guys have, if you want to slide it up to me, uh, I'll take a look at it. And uh, we'll get back to uh, second derivatives uh, after this. All right. So here's example two for talking about second derivatives. I think after this one, I'm going to do send you guys to work on another group work. Okay, Let's see see if you can follow this. So so try and do this with me, so that um, oh you can't say anything yet. Try and do this with me so that then you can try it yourself. Okay. So let's see. I have f of x is two x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x plus 5. And so I'm going to compute the first derivative and the second derivative. And then we'll see what we can learn about the graph based on that. First derivative f prime of x is 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. And the second derivative f double prime of x is 12x minus 6. So 
Did we, d does the second derivative tell me anything? Well, I want to figure out where is it positive and where is it negative. So why don't we start out and figure out, let's, let's set f double prime of x equal to 0. So 12x minus 6 is 0. So 12x is 6. So divide, and what do you get? x equals Yeah? One half? And so if I, you know, take a look here, I could put one half on my number line, and then I could do test points and I'd figure out where it's concave up and where it's concave down. You guys with me? And if it switches, then this would be called what? It switches from one to the other, this would be called point of inflection. Okay? So that's what we learned so far. But I want to show you something else we learned. Okay? Remember, we learned the first derivative test, and we used it to find maximums and minimums, right? Well, there's a test called the second derivative test that can help us find maximums and minimums. So I kind of like to work them at the same time. Let me show you what I'm going to do. If I told you guys, find relative extrema. There's the word from the book. I'm talking about relative maximums or relative minimums, right? So if I say that that's what I want to do, find the relative extrema, you take the first derivative. Okay, and what do I do now? Take that and set it equal to zero. So I want to find the critical values. What would you guys do with this equation, by the way? How would you guys solve it? You might be able to factor it with, right? And I heard you mention FOIL. Yeah, because it's a trinomial. Although I can make it easier on myself, at first, what do I do? Factor out a 6, maybe? Sometimes that helps. So if I factor out the GCF of 6, then I get x squared minus x minus 2. Sometimes that makes it easier. Did it make it easier here? Well, I guess the nice thing is x squared, there's only one way to get that, x times x. And there's only one way to get 2, 2 and 1. And then the fact that it's negative 2, what's that tell you about the signs? Yeah, one's positive, one's negative. Which one? Minus 2 plus 1. Minus 2 plus 1. Okay. So that's one thing is that, you know, all that factoring you studied at some point in algebra may come back here. Okay. Uh, one last thing. Hey, guys, if you couldn't factor this equation, how else could you solve it? Quadratic the quadratic formula, remember that one? That comes in handy also. Okay. But we can solve it. We get x equals 2, and we get x equals negative 1. Okay. And, and what you do, of course, normally, if we do the first derivative test, how does that work? That's from last time. Well, you would put negative 1 on the number line, you put positive 2 on the number line, and then you would um, test 1, 2, 3 points, and then you'd know, right, if it's a maximum or a minimum. You guys with me? I don't want to do this today. I want to show you the second derivative test in set. So let's try that. We will try the second derivative test. For these critical values. Let me show you how to do that. See, we already computed the second derivative. It's 12x minus 6, right? Let me write that down again. 
f double prime of x is 12x minus 6. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a critical value and I'm going to put it into the second derivative. Watch. f double prime of negative 1. That's 12 times negative 1 minus 6. Which is what? I don't think so. Negative 18, right? Actually, I don't care what it equals, but I do care that it's negative. Because if it's negative, what does that mean? We are concave what? Down. Down. And by the way, there's a little mnemonic I have. Concave down, frown. Right? And then what I like to do is I like to put the little point like this right there. That's the critical value. So if you know it's a critical value and you know you're concave down, do you think this is a relative maximum or a relative minimum? Well, look at the picture. Yeah. We know from the second derivative test that we have a relative maximum at x equals negative 1. You know you have a relative maximum now at x equals negative 1. You guys follow? Try it for positive 2, see what happens. Try to do the second derivative test on the critical value positive 2. Twelve times two minus six, so it'd be positive, right? What's that mean? Positive means concave up, concave up, cup, concave down, frown, concave up, cup, like this. So what does that tell me? What do you know about the critical value two? We have a relative minimum at x equals 2. And the funny thing is, now I know what would have happened if I had done the first derivative test, right? If I had done some test points on the first derivative test, I didn't do them. We would have been increasing there, decreasing there, and increasing there. Right? That's what would have happened, because you would have got a relative maximum here and a relative minimum there. Hey, here's a question. Does it always change from positive to negative to positive? Does it always change when you hit one of these things? No, not always, right? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's not, e it's not a maximum or a minimum, right? It just has a horizontal tangent line. But anyways, this is a real nice thing to do. If I had worked out over here, the second derivative, well, let's see. We tried negative 1 as a test point. We were concave down. So we would have been concave down over here. And then we tried it over here, and we would have been concave up over here. So whenever I do calculus on these functions, I kind of use both derivatives, right? I use the first derivative to get the critical values. I use the second derivative test to tell me about concavity. And that also kind of gives away whether they're relative maximums or minimums. Well, I think you guys have to try this to know whether or not you understood it. It's, it's one thing to see it, but I, like I said, I want you to put it into practice. So I have a group work for that. And then I think we'll be uh, nearing the end for today. God, I wanted to show you guys the picture of the graph because we found here's negative 1, there's that relative maximum. Here's positive 2, there's the relative minimum. And then the point of inflection at a half is right around there. So it switches from concave up to concave down. Anyways.
forgot to mention it. Might as well throw it there at you. Let's get back to work here. Um, hey guys, I worked out the, the first problem okay. I think you guys got this, right? We're concave down from negative infinity to positive one. True. Concave up from one to infinity. True. Okay. And then at the bottom it says, now go back, find the critical values, and do the uh, first, do the second derivative test. Well, here's, here's this first derivative. So if you want to do the critical values, you have to set that equal to zero. And I tried to factor it, and this is where I said, no luck, you need the quadratic formula. Right? So sometimes things don't factor. I can show you that if, I want, if you want, but my preference was this. If you take a look at my plan for today, okay, this was example two, right? We did x e to the x, that was example one. Here's example two. I only had one other plan. Three examples is all I had planned for this section. And sure enough, it's this one, problem two. Would you guys like to see this? Okay. And one thing that might be helpful, too, is to actually have a graph of it. So I have a graph here on the computer. You could put it on your calculator if you want. Um, it's not real pretty. Well, maybe it is. Depends on your thing. It's point of view, right? But look how, look how much it hugs the y-axis here. And then it comes back down. So I think, if I'm looking at this right, there's a relative minimum around here somewhere. And the relative maximum is way up there somewhere. Well, maybe, maybe we'll see that by the time we're done. Okay. But I'm going to go ahead and try and work, work this through with you. So let's see. I'm thinking of x squared as my u, and I'm thinking of 6 minus x cubed as my v. And so I know I need, well, u prime v plus u v prime when I do the first derivative. So here I go. u prime v. So f prime of x would be 2x times 6 minus x cubed, right, plus... And you might just need a new sheet of paper. I don't know. Maybe maybe you'll find it. Or maybe you're maybe you did this. Plus U V prime, so it would be X squared. Now, I want to take the derivative of V. I'm gonna to need to use the chain rule, right? So bing! Let's write down the three. Bing! Six minus X to what power, guys? Second power. Bong! I need to take the derivative of what's inside. I need to take the derivative of 6 minus x. That's, one. That's negative 1. Because it's 0 minus 1. You guys with me? So what is this equal? Let's simplify it. Well, it's 2x times 6 minus x cubed. And then here, are you guys okay if I write minus 3x squared times 6 minus x squared. Does that make sense? Because I have the negative 1, I have the 3x squared. Okay. This okay? I still want to continue to simplify this first derivative before I go taking another one. Okay? I mean, some of you may have now taken the derivative of that. But I want to go ahead and simplify a little bit more and see if it helps. Watch. I'm going to ask myself, what's common here? And I'm going to say, well, isn't there an x that's common to both? There's actually something else that's common to both. 6 minus x quantity squared is common to both. Now if I take all that out, what am I left with? Well, in the first term, I'd be left with a 2. I didn't take that out. And I think I'd also be left with a 6 minus x. You guys with me? What about the second term? What are we left with in the second term? 
Yeah, minus 3x, right? Because the 6 minus x squared came out and one of the x's came out. So that's what I have so far. So this equals x times 6 minus x squared times 12 minus 2x minus 3x when I distribute. And so f prime of x, after all that work, is x times 6 minus x quantity squared times 12 minus 5x. And it's just a bunch of stuff multiplied together now. But one of the reasons I decided to keep going was because if you look at the directions at the bottom, one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go back, find the critical values of each function. Well, now I can tell you the critical values. What are the critical values of this function? Well, from this factor I get x equals 0 is a critical value, right? By the way, what are we going to have at x equals 0? Look at the picture. I, I can see from the picture it's going to be a relative what? Do you see it or not? It's a relative minimum. See how this little red curve is really like a skinny parabolic thing? Okay. We'll probably see that shortly. Now, x equals 6 is another critical value. And what about this last one? Well, to get this last one, I have to do 12 minus 5x equals 0. 12 equals 5x. So x equals... 12 fifths, which is 2.4, that would be another critical value. So there's actually three different critical values here. And I'd like to know, do I get relative maximums or relative minimums from these things? We will use the second derivative test uh, for that, but I need the second derivative first, or I can't, can't do it. So here I go. I've got to make some room here. How about over here? We'll do it kind of right over here. All right, so if I want to take the second derivative, I need to write down the first derivative before I start. And I'd like to do it this way. f prime of x equals, hey, watch this, guys. I'm going to take that x, and I'm going to bring it in here. So what I have is, let's see if this makes sense to you, 6 minus x quantity squared times... 12x minus 5x squared. And I decided to do that because then this is my u, and this is my v, and I'll be able to just do product rule. If I didn't do it, I'd have three things multiplied together, but it's easier when you just have two at a time. So, again, let me move this down so you can see it clearly. Do you guys see what I'm doing? Okay. So what would be the second derivative? F double prime of x. So again, I'm going to do u prime v. So when I do u prime v, I get bing, bing, bong, times the v. Right? Steve? Shouldn't it be a negative 1? I meant to say that. Thank you. Negative 1 is the, the bong. What's that, Lauren? I, I thought that, but I was like... No, you're right. No, I just went too quickly. So bing, bing, bong, and then times v plus u would be 6 minus x quantity squared times what? Well, I guess it'd be, when I take v prime, it would be 12 minus 10x, right? How many are with me so far? Okay. So, what do you think I'm about to do now? It's what I told you we like to do after we take derivatives is we like to pull out the common 
factor. So you look at this whole big mess at the start, you look at this big mess here, and you say, well, one thing that they have in common is there's a 6 minus x in each of them. So I'll pull it out front. So let's see what we're left with. We'd be left with negative 2 here, because I have negative 1 and a 2, times 12x minus 5x squared. And then here I have, after the plus sign, I have, well, if I took one of the 6 minus x's out, I'd still have one. 6 minus x, and I'd have a 12 minus 10x. So that's what I have so far. And I think I have to keep simplifying what's inside those brackets. So let me do that. 6 minus x times, for the sake of time, I'll just kind of work this out. Let's see, we have 6 minus x times negative 24x plus 10x squared plus, and then here you do first outer inner last. So I'm getting plus 72 minus 60x minus 12x plus 10x squared. Wow, that's kind of ugly. All after this big bracket. So let's write parentheses 6 minus x times bracket. So let's see, how many x squareds do we have? Well, we have um, a 10 and a 10. That's 20x squared. And then how many x's? Well, there's one here, negative 24, and negative 60, and negative 12. Is that negative 96x? Plus 72. That's what I got. You guys getting what I'm getting? <laughs> hey, let me do this, guys. I want to factor that big thing in the brackets? Is there a common factor I can pull out to make it easier? I think 4 goes into each one of them, right? So let me do that. So let's see, we have 5x squared minus, now the only way I know this one, this guy's, know, I know 25 times 4 is a dollar, 100. So this is 24x right here. And then when I take a 4 out of there, I get 18. Now, I really, really wish that that factored. I don't know if it does. Wouldn't it be great if this thing in brackets could be written as two binomials, like if it was 5x times x to get 5x squared? And then I'd have to think of factors of 18 that worked, right? I mean, like, you know, 1 times 18, 2 times 9, or 3 times 6 in the right order so that I'd end up with 24. But I don't know if it works, guys. Be great if it did. Fifteen and six is twenty-one. Yeah, I'm not so sure. I better pause while I think about this one. Unfortunately, doesn't factor. So this is f double prime of x. It's the best I could do, I guess. I told you guys this one's kind of nasty, right? Okay. So, you guys, all right? All right, guys, here we go now. Here we go. It says, now see if you can go back, find the critical values of each function. I did that in red. 
and use the second derivative to classify whether they are relative maxima, relative minima, or neither. For example, one of them is x equals 0, right? So if I want to do f double prime of 0, f double prime of 0, let me put it on there so you can see it. What I'll do is I'll take this function I just did, and everywhere it says x, I'm going to put in what? 0. Let's see what I get. I get 6 times 4 times, that bracket thing would just be 18 because the other stuff goes away, right? And again, I don't care what it equals. All I care is that it's positive. So that means concave up cup. And therefore, we have a relative what? Minimum at x equals what? Zero. And I'm going to go back to the graph for a minute to show you that indeed we do have a relative minimum at x equals zero. That's what I showed you guys. Okay. Moving right along. If you try six, f double prime of six, do you know what you get? You get zero. What does that mean? Well, it means it's not a relative max or a relative min. Not relative max or min. You see, you could have a critical value, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a relative max or min. And let's look on the picture and see what happened. This, this is actually the reason I chose this example. You guys see that here? Right. X equals zero, you can, or x equals six, you can see it goes through six, zero. It's not a relative max, it's not a relative min, it's just that the tangent lines through there as a slope zero, and then it starts doing this, right? Actually, do you know what x equals six is? It's not a relative max or relative min, do you know what it is called? Yes, because on the left of it, we are concave up, but once you get past it, then we're concave down. You guys see that? So it kind of shows you how these things all interact. Um, I'm out of time. I don't know if I can do 2.4 for you. I believe you'd get concave down and it would be a relative maximum then, concave down frown, but you know you could work it out on your own I guess if you want to. Okay. Definitely enough for today. Nice work today, guys. I